Hey, it's Bill Stage, and I'm with uh, Mike Federer of Photography Digital Imaging. That's not the right name of your business. <laughs> photography Professional Imaging. Thank you. Uh, there's uh, a lot of stuff going on. You the photography right. Most, <laughs> most people say Fito. I got your name right. What more do you want from me? <laughs> That's all I can ask. Mike is in here because he's done uh, something really cool uh, in the midst of uh, what the devastation in downtown Davenport. He's put together this, uh, this picture that you see behind us. Uh, Put up so uh, professionally on on the <laughs> the garbage can back here, but hey, it's radio. You're not supposed to, and that normally be uh, checking out the images here. But uh, we wanted Mike to come in and kind of give us a, a history of this this awesome photograph and um, some really cool things that are going to be going along with this, which we'll get into in a little bit. But first, Mike, I just kind of wanted to talk about how did you get into fo- uh, photography? Actually, this all started when I was about uh, ten years old. My uncle was a professional photographer, did a lot of weddings and things like that. Mm-hmm. And um, it just kind of got under my skin then. I saw the way he do- he did things. And as a kid, I started to realize that it wasn't just taking snapshots where he would actually create imagery. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what um, got me into it and to realize that it was more of an art form than it is just taking pictures. Right. Um, I actually bought my first camera from him when I was about 11 or 12 years old, and I still have it to this day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was the kid that was underneath the bed looking for different angles of things rather than, you know, standing up and taking, you know, snapshots. Sure. You know. So that's kind of how it all started. So you got to have a, a creative brain to, to get the kind of stuff that you've been doing and some of the shots that, that you're known for. Um, how, do you, how do you merge that with business? How did you decide that this is what I want to do for a living? You know, it's been a long time coming, actually. Like I said, since I was 10 years old, but I've done so many other jobs in the meantime. Um, I didn't take it. I've never taken an art course, never taken a photography course, never taken a business course. Hmm. I actually started off as a sophomore in high school, rust proofing cars, believe it or not. Uh, my dad retired as an auto mechanic. Hmm. And in high school at United Township, uh, in the vocational classes over there, I actually took auto mechanics in that. And I found it came easily to me. So Started off rust proofing cars, then ultimately moved to the night shift, working as a line mechanic there, and then ultimately up to the daytime, mm-hmm. you know, a line mechanic. And I did that for 11 years. Um, eventually got tired of that, went into HVAC, working with heating and air conditioning, and I was working at Norcross Safety Products for a while, uh, doing imports of boots and shoes from China, which was really kind of boring. Yeah, uh, yeah. I had one email coming in in the morning and one going out. The rest yeah. of the time I was staring at four cinder block walls all day long. Yikes. And then eventually went to the President Riverboat Casino where I met my lovely wife. Mm-hmm. And I um, was there probably, I don't know, five or six years, I guess. Mm-hmm. And then after that, just a couple of other things came and went. But uh, this was always there in the background. Yeah. And it was always a hobby at that point. But once I decided that I wanted to do this for a living, it just came to how am I going to do it? Right. And so we'd go to the day job from you know eight hours a day, come home and have dinner and spend some time with the kids. And then yeah. after they go to bed, I'm down in my office in the basement till two o'clock in the morning. That's side hustle. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's a that's a good way to do it. That's the way a lot of people uh, get into their their own business. And, and mm-hmm. that's uh, I think it also helps to to be doing jobs that you know you do not want to do. I worked on the factory line <laughs> yeah. for my ver- first job out of summer, and I said uh, out of school, and I said, "Nope, I'm going to sit in an air conditioned office for, and I'm going to do radio for the rest of my life." Yeah, I mean, I was in the RV <laughs> business as well, and you know that was fun, but you know, you're working every weekend. Mm. And, um, it, it's exactly like you said. I've had those jobs where you literally feel sick to your stomach getting into your vehicle yeah. to go to this job, and you're just you can't wait to get out of there, but you know it's going to happen all over again the next day. Right. So as of right now, I don't think there's any other way that I could go back to punching a clock. Sure. You know, just the freedom that this affords me, the time I can spend with my kids. Yeah. The work's still there, and mm-hmm. you've got to hustle. Mm-hmm. You know, if I don't sell it, nobody buys it. That's right. So you got to be out there and, and working. I'm still working late hours. But, yeah. You know. um, is Do you have a, a particularly um, – your favorite kind of shot, whether it's a portrait or uh, do you have a, f- a favorite setting or a, a medium to shoot or? Well, over a um, well, full frame is what I'm using. I'm using Sony's now, but I did uh, Canon full frame uh, cameras for 10 years, mm-hmm. but uh, recently switched over to Sony because the demand for video is so huge from all of my clients. But to kind of get back to your question, I've started off with weddings for the first eight years, and I was averaging about 30 weddings a year. Mm. And that's just one person, basically. You know, yeah. I have an assistant that goes with me, but everything on the back end is all me. I'm the accountant. I'm you know, the marketing guy. I'm yeah. everything. It's not just the shots during the wedding. You get a whole week's worth of work afterwards. <laughs> exactly. 
But as far as favorite, that's kind of what I fell in love with to begin with. My uncle, like I said, was a wedding photographer, and mm -hmm. I can remember being in, in the pews at the church and watching him work, and he was pretty much uh, old school. You know, they were kind of straight up posed pictures, but as I was looking around, I would see things happening around those moments that mm -hmm. I wish I had a camera right. with me to capture. So that's kind of the way I approach the wedding industry, the, right. my wedding photography style, I guess, if you want to call it. But it's more about the moments instead of the posed pictures and making hearts with your hands and yep, holding yep. up signs and stuff like that. It's, right. You know, you're missing too many things when you do that. Gotcha. Um, and and you started the um, the actual business. Is it um, about 2010? Did I read on your Facebook? Yeah. And mm -hmm. then and then you did a rebrand, which yes. encompassed the more of the digital imagery. Yeah, it used to be photography portraits, mm -hmm. but with the commercial work that I've done, the drone work that I do, um, you know, portraits kind of pigeonholed me into something that you know may have detracted from gaining that business. So. Right. By taking that knowledge and, and pulling in the commercial end of it, professional imaging seemed to just kind of fit a whole lot better for what I was doing. And, of course, that brings in a, a whole new slew of toys to play with. Yes, much <laughs> much to my wife's chagrin. <laughs> I mean, I've had a drone basically since they came out. I mean, yeah. if, we, if we move over to the drone side of things here, but, you know, that technology is advancing so fast. Um, and actually, the drone that I took these photos with to make to create this pano I've since sold and purchased a new one within the past week. Yeah, and, upgrade. Uh, man. Again, my wife hates me. It's just a good. <laughs> let's just say it's a good thing I have a different shipping address at my studio than my house. <laughs> That's right. that <laughs> it makes it a little easier to slide things in. Talk about life hacks. That's good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Pardon me while I snort, but that was funny. <laughs> No, yeah. that's uh, that's really cool. I love that the whole kind of shift, the rebrand, and and taking your business and and really just up leveling everything. Still doing everything that you're known for, but just mm -hmm. giving your customers an an extra little uh, oomph. Yeah, you know, I mentioned being gone on the weekends, and obviously with weddings, thirty weddings a year, I was gone literally every weekend, mm -hmm. and I'm missing the events that my boys are doing, ball games, things like that. Yeah, I wanted my weekends back, so by design, over the past couple of years, I've literally started to cut back purposely on the mm -hmm. wedding end of things and fill it up with the commercial um, types of jobs yep. during the week. You know, other business owners don't want to be gone on the weekends either. So if we yeah. can do their, you know, their projects during the week, all the better. Exactly. Um, when, when you started doing the drones, mm -hmm. um, did you ever, did you buy it specifically for the, uh, the business to take it to that next level or did you just buy it and, you know, Oh man, this is a fun little toy. And no, I just bought it for pleasure yeah. uh, to begin with. And then, before I knew it, I found myself wanting to. Now, the original ones didn't come with cameras on them like they do today. Sure. So I found myself actually buying an aftermarket gimbal, which keeps the camera steady as you're mm -hmm. flying through the air. And so I tore the drone apart and wired it in. Yeah. And mounted everything, mounted a GoPro to it, and uh, crashed it a couple times. But, sure. Uh, but that's kind of where it all started with the drones. And then eventually the technology just keeps going and going and going to, yeah. to now you can pick one up off the shelf and pretty much... You know, at least get those videos and pictures that you're looking for. Right. But, you know, being on the professional end of things, I think it's there's something to say for those people that are professionals that basically you take that camera with, you know, a handheld camera that you might shoot a wedding with and have that technology in a drone and have that entirely different viewpoint of the world and be able to create artwork, mm -hmm. um, you know, with a purpose yep. and comp composition and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, lo I love uh, getting new toys. So if as, if you look at my uh, setup here, it's very simple. I'm just shooting on an iPhone and an input here. What's my next step up from here, Mike? If I can if I can use your uh, recommendation to take this to my wife, what what's the next toy I can buy? <laughs> well, I don't know your wife that well, so I don't want to get stepped in a bucket here. But you know the uh, the digital cameras nowadays, the still still cameras, do very very good video. Yeah, and uh, that's one reason why I switched from Canon to Sony, as I mentioned earlier because Canon, in order to get good video, you're literally stepping up into their quote-unquote video cameras and you're looking right. at spending 10 grand or so, whereas you can buy a Sony A7 III, which I have a couple of now, and you can get into that for a couple grand. Mm -hmm. you know? Not saying that your wife would approve, but <laughs> you know, even something small like the Osmo Pocket, you know, which you and I kind of talked about a little bit here, yeah. that's a $350 little camera that has its own built-in gimbal, so as you're walking cool. down the street and vlogging, it stays completely perfectly still. And do you do any vlogging yourself? Yeah, you know, I'm trying to get back into it. I mm -hmm. did it for a while. I actually had a Facebook group for a while. Um, I did have, uh, I actually teach uh, photography both online and mm -hmm. in person at the studio. Gotcha. So, you know, photography is my gig, man. I mean, yeah. that's just, it, I eat, live, and breathe it. Yeah, you know, that's awesome. Every day, all day. Very cool. So tell me a little bit about, because you got certified to fly a drone. You actually have your, your pilot license. What all did that entail? 
Yeah, that's been about three years ago now. But in order to do any kind of commercial photography or videography with a drone, in other words, if you're making money with a drone, or it doesn't even have to necessarily be making money, if you are, if, I think they word it, if you are in the furtherance of a business, then you have to be licensed. Gotcha. So, and that's got nothing to do with controlling the drone. Yeah. It's literally probably a couple of chapters of study away from actual, an actual private pilot's license. Mm. And it's no joke. You go in there and they give you two hours to do 60 multiple choice questions. And that seems like a lot of a lot of time to finish mm -hmm. a multiple choice questionnaire. But in reality, the FAA doesn't mess around and they switch words around and try to make it, you know, they want to make sure that you know exactly what you're talking about. Right. And if you don't mess it, uh, make it the first time, if you don't pass it the first time, you can't just go back the same afternoon. You have to wait a couple of weeks and then pay for the test again, which sure. I think was 150 bucks. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's no joke. Mm -hmm. um, but in order to do this commercially, which I wanted to do, that's you know those are the steps you have to take. Right. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about this picture behind sure. us. Uh, where did you get the idea of uh, of taking this? I mean, it's a, a massive undertaking. It's a, a beautiful picture Thank of, you. A, of a horrible disaster. How did you get the idea to document this? Yeah, I'm, I think you know, being a, a resident of Quad Cities my whole life and living in Davenport, watching the news broadcasts and the news coverage. You know, it was fine, except for the fact that the, any video you saw of the flood was literally three seconds, and it might have covered half a block of, you know, aerial videography. You know, everybody can, everybody's, it's starting to be like digital photography. Everybody has a drone now. Yep. But between that and the still photography, you might see just, you know, the ball diamond or the Figgy Art Museum or something like that, just small bits and pieces of different parts of the flood. And as a photographer, that was kind of bothering me because it wasn't really telling the entire story of the right. magnitude of the flood of the entire shoreline. Um, you know, believe it or not, I've talked to people that don't live around the area who have thought that it was literally just a block or two mm. or just behind Peterson because that was, you know, what where the Hesco barrier broke. Sure. On the other hand, my wife and I were trying to sell our camper because it was 13 years old and we had inquiries from out of state. And people were asking me if the, the camper was had been in the flood. Mm. So on one end, you got people that think it's one block long. And on the other end, you th have people that think the entire state of Iowa is underwater. Right. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, expand on that and kind of show the big picture for, mm -hmm. you know, to, to use a pun here. Yeah. But that was the idea behind it. Um, you know, aside from that, I think a lot of that had to, those smaller pictures had to do with the fact that these other drone pilots, people flying drones, didn't have the knowledge about how to put an entire thing like that together because yep. the further you fly away, you have to fly far away in order to get the entire shoreline unless you know how to piece this together. Yeah. So that's where, you know, if you fly too far away, the shoreline gets that big. Right. So this had to be done a completely different way. So this isn't just one shot that no, you've got here. No, actually, this is uh, a three by 14. In other words, there are three rows of 14 pictures in each row. So mm. 42 images total. Gotcha. Um, I took off from Schwebert Park in Rock Island, so the mm -hmm. other side of the Mississippi. I flew up to 370 feet above ground level and then got the drone positioned right where I wanted it. Uh, you'll notice that Main Street is right in the center of the photograph because that in turn uh, splits the city of Davenport, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, and believe it or not, I thought about this all the night before. I was losing sleep about oh, yeah. how I wanted to compose it. Sure. Because I had basically one shot at it. This is the morning that the flood broke the record. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the flood. This is a moment in history. Mm -hmm. uh, where the flood was at its highest point and broke the record, the previous record of 1993. So, uh, yeah, again, 370 feet from across the river, Main Street in the center, and hovered the aircraft and just started taking photographs, starting from the top and kind of worming, if you will, back and forth mm -hmm. into 42 separate images, and then get it back to the studio and start piecing all of those together to create this one panorama. Yeah. What do you, you know, because it's, if you look at it, it's it's this crazy, you know, disastrous flood and then the beautiful blue sky. What if it was a crummy day? What if it was what if it, it broke and and uh, and it was lightning and thunder? You couldn't have gone out there. Do you think no. it would have told a different story? Uh, it would have been certainly a little more gloomy. Yeah, that's for sure. But if the weather would have been too bad, I wouldn't have been able, been able to pull it off at all. Yeah, um, I even I had to get I still had to get the FAA's permission to fly this mission. You can't mm. just take take up a drone anywhere you have to get a certificate of authorization from the FAA in order to do this. Gotcha. So I did that actually the night before and acquired that. But you're right. A lot of people have asked me if I'd replace that sky in Photoshop right. or something like that. But in reality, that's just the way it looked that day. So gotcha. it was a beautiful day. Yeah. You know, and, and you mentioned the contrast between the devastation down there and mm -hmm. the beauty of the photograph, which is something I've been fighting with since 
May 5th, since sure. the day this was made. Yeah. I haven't taken it to a lot of downtown businesses mm-hmm. or, or residents or anybody down there because, you know, if I were to take it to them on May 7th, May 10th, nobody wanted it's to see anything about the flood. Want, yeah, exactly. last thing they want to hear about. Exactly. So now that everything's receded mm-hmm. and um, hopefully just about everybody is back up, you know, doing business, uh, it's something that I want to revisit with them. Mm-hmm. Maybe they'll want to put it up now and be able to look back and say, this is what we had to go through to get back to where we are today. So um, you've done a limited run of these for sale on your website. Mm -hmm. um, And and some of it is going to to charity. If if people are interested in in checking this out and uh, and buying it, what's uh, what's a good way to get a hold of you? Basically, they can call the studio at 309-757-9977, or they can, like you mentioned, visit the website at www.fetproimaging.com. The photographs are listed there and for sale. They're available in three different sizes. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a three-foot, four-foot, and five-foot size. Uh, The actual dimensions will be listed there as well. Yeah. And um, each one, uh, this run is, uh, each one of these sizes is printed on a luster metallic paper. So it's a special photo paper. It's not just a regular matte finish like you might normally get. Mm-hmm. So and each one is signed and numbered by me, as well as dated with the date that the flood broke the record that this was created on, of course, mm-hmm. and then 22.7 uh, feet, which was the actual record-breaking crest. Gotcha. So... Well, that's uh, it's it's a striking photo, and and uh, it it takes a very creative mind to be able to put this thing together. So I'm I'm glad you're doing it, Mike. It's it's very cool. Thank you. Uh, another cool thing that uh, that you got going on, you've uh, had somebody reach out to you to to have this on display. Do you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, actually, um, I got in, I was contacted or got in contact with the Putnam Museum. Mm-hmm. And was able to present uh, a copy very similar, of, like uh, similar to this one, to uh, the proprietor, not the proprietor, the curator over there. And it had to go to their committee, but mm-hmm. the committee has had their vote, and they've decided that they want a copy of this to be archived at the Putnam Museum gotcha. for eternity. So that's that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. That's cool. To think that I did this as a, you know, originally I did this as just something for myself, something I wanted to document the day on and hang mm-hmm. in my home office and hang in my right. studio. It's kind of Again, pardon the pun, it's taken off. And, yeah. You know, uh, something I would plan on keep, keeping to myself, but when I took it to the print lab, the guys there are like, dude, you, know, yeah. you got to get this out there. People would want this. Yeah. So now a, it's going to the Putnam Museum, and it's really kind of crazy. It's been a crazy ride. So uh, what do we need to do? Do we need to, to you know, call these people to, to get them to be able to put it out on display and not just archive it? Do we need to, you know, do a petition? How does I, I that work? I think that's a great idea, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of... Uh, that was certainly uh, a pipe dream of mine to have it on display, mm-hmm. but on the other hand, it is enough for me to to know that it's there. That if my children or their children, you know, know about it, obviously mm-hmm. they can take their kids there and and actually yeah. know that it's there and has right. my name on it and all that good stuff. Maybe uh, maybe like the ten year anniversary or something, we'll we'll get it out on display and it'll be far enough removed. It won't be to you know. People, uh, it'll be a distant memory, and people will be able to appreciate it without yeah, feeling so close to it. And I think that's another thing that's kind of uh, kind of cool about this too. Is even ten years from now, it, it may even become more sought after mm-hmm. because it's it's just happened here, obviously, yep. and it's still fresh in people's minds. But you know, hopefully, this doesn't happen this bad again. Yeah, but you never know. Um, yeah. So it's it's something nice to look back on. Yeah. Well, uh, I appreciate your uh, your creative mind. I think this is very cool. The, the other stuff that I've seen on your Facebook, uh, you're obviously a, a talented photographer, and I appreciate you coming in, Mike. Thank you very much. Right, I brother. appreciate it. Yes, sir.